thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present some thoughts on a rather remarkable author uh, in this great location, a place uh, I think Sir William Hope of Balcomy would have liked tremendously, especially the second floor. Um, years ago, when roaming around London antique shops, I stumbled upon something which made me a bit curious. It was basically an anti-dueling treatise written by an expert fencing master. Indeed, it was a copy of William Hope's Vindication of the True Art of Self-Defense. Now, why would someone who made a living out of training gentlemen to survive and win duels write such a book? Wasn't that rather bad for business? To cut a long story short, when I dived into William Hope's work and life, I discovered that he was not only an expert swordsman, a teacher and writer, but also someone who one may label as an early proponent of the Enlightenment, someone already profoundly touched by elements of this emerging philosophical school, someone who incorporated reason and critique of the traditions into the system, of, into his system of swordplay. Learning by experience, by mistake, and a pedagogical impetus, a desire to simplify things and make them as practical as possible, as well as to do away with rituals. Moreover, a lust for innovation and the desire to better human conditions by utilizing human reason, all this one may discover in Hope's writing and his system. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, to you uh, Hope's life and time, and in the second part, I uh, intend to show how the spirit of enlightenment inspired uh, his school of swordplay. Um, I hope uh, I'll succeed in connecting um, elements of the history uh, of martial arts to uh, the history of ideas and the history of violence. Um, I do not desire to assess the innovation of every thrust or beat Hope advocates. Instead, I would like to introduce a man with universal interests and a high methodological and theoretical standards. He was profoundly educated, interested in question of politics and society, and above all, very productive. This makes him special among uh, the many authors of fight books of the early 18th century, that is the age of the small sword. I do not want to decide whether his new method was indeed revolutionary, uh, as he himself, of course, claimed. Um, it is much more interesting to understand how he shaped it, how he developed it, how methods and mindsets that later became core and bone of the Enlightenment were used and incorporated into Hope's thought play. To me, it is the hanging guard that central techniques of Hope's new method of fencing that symbolizes of this and that explains the, t the title of this talk. Unfortunately, I'm not able to present a picture of William Hope. To my knowledge, there is none. Few details are known about his life. However, I've been able to fill in some of the gaps. Hope was born in April 1660 and died in February 1724, aged 64. We do not know much about his family. His father was Sir John Hope of Hopetown. It seems his parents were rather well-to-do, uh, thus being able to educate their youngest son rather well. Again, we do not know any details about his education, but we may conclude from his writings that Hope was in command of Latin and of French. Um, the second half of the 17th century uh, in Scotland was a rather violent era of history. Thus Hope, in spite of his good education, pursued a military career. We do not know any details, again, on these years of Hope's life. However, again, from his writings, one may conclude that he fought abroad and made experiences on the continent. Between 1700 and 1705, Hope served as a deputy governor of the castle of Edinburgh. Aged 38, uh, he was created a baronet first designated of Grand Thune and Kirklestone. This was changed into Balcomy later, an estate he purchased around the turn of the century. Now, Hope was not only known as a keen dancer, fencer, and horseman, 
but also as a ruthless and cunning businessman. He was engaged in large-scale <laughs> land deals, and uh, in the case of the estate of Balcomy, he seems to have dispossessed a widow by rather dubious means. The case was even investigated and ultimately decided by the Scottish Parliament. As I said, Sir William Hope's lifetime was violent and terminus. The years between the restoration of Scottish independence in 1660 and the Acts of Union in 1707 were characterized by religious strife, a succession of Jacobite risings against William of Orange after the Glorious Revolution of 1688, and of course, economic crisis. Moreover, Scotland and many Scotsmen were involved in one way or another into two major conflicts on the continent, known as King William's War, in Deutsch Pfälzischer Erbfolgekrieg, and Queen Anne's War, the Spanische Erbfolgekrieg. The Acts of Union triggered another string of Jacobite, ri Jacobite risings during Hope's lifetime, uh, as there was, for instance, the so-called 15 in 1715. However, this turbulent time was also the founding period of an intellectual current which was later on called Scottish Enlightenment. Its fundamental principles are the same as in England and later on in France and in Germany. It aims to understand the world by human reasoning, by means of constant critique of traditions and by building on human experience. Enlightenment is anthropocentric in as so much as it tries to discard irrelevant and superstitious beliefs and rituals which prevent a practical approach towards human life and human action, thus restraining human development. Cognition is now seen as a process, not as an, as an intuition granted by divine grace. Enlightenment thus was understood by its proponent as a constant human condition as well as a method, which was supposed to embrace every aspect of human life. Man is there to learn and to strive for personal perfection. The roots of Scottish Enlightenment may be traced to the 17th century. At the advent of the Union with England, there were five Scottish universities in England. There were only two. Access was much easier than in any other European country. This may be due to the high esteem education in general was held in Scotland. And this again may be traced back to the 15th century when the so-called Education Act of 1496 provided that any freeholder was to send his sons to grammar school. Thus, there was enough intellectual humus in Edinburgh and Glasgow to grow new ideas. In the 1710s, this new movement was in, already in full bloom. It flourished up to the 19th century and embraced literature, philosophy, economics, and natural science. Names like Francis Hutchison, George Turnbull, both contemporaries of William Hope, David Hume, and later on Adam Smith need to be mentioned here. No wonder that this powerful intellectual current did massively influence the swordsman and fencing master William Hope. He was no one-hit wonder. Contrary uh, to many other authors on swordplay of the age of the small sword, as for instance, Labat, McBain, or Angelo. We know today of seven publications on fencing, one translation of a manual on horsemanship from the French, uh, and one political treatise on dueling. It is most striking that Hope's system is developing from publication to publication. He never claims, he never ever claims to present a final system, but always concedes that there is development according to growing experience. His first book, The Scots Fencing Master, was published when he was only 27 years old. It comprises the conventional knowledge of small sword fencing of the time, thus showing an almost exclusively French and Italian influence. However, young William Hope, by now already an experienced soldier, already in his first book shows a desire to make small sword fencing more practical and more effective more fitting for the battlefield and for self-defense, less ritualistic, less focused on dueling, and also less elegant. In short, less French and less Italian. In 1687, 
Hope was able to express this desire in theory, but it was not yet incorporated into his system. However, it seems he already knew where to look for in order to overhaul the dominating French and Italian style, the broad and backsword system of his native Scotland, which an example can be seen there on that poster uh, that's very illustrating for this influence. Thus, uh, he wrote in the Scots Fencing Master, quote, I say, if a man should be forced to make use of sharps, our Scots play is, in my opinion, far beyond any I ever saw abroad as for security. And the reason why I think so is because all French play appeareth to the eyes of the spectators to be far neater and gentler way of playing than ours. But no man that understands what secure fencing is will ever call this kind of play sure play. As I said, Hope was a clever businessman. He published all of his books in Edinburgh as well as in London in order to get a bigger market. The Scots Fencing Master, however, appeared in England by the title of the Complete Fencing Master. Scots were not very popular in England in these times, and uh, I guess uh, Hope knew that very well. His second book is very remarkable. Uh, the Swordsman's Vademecum of 1691 is much more than a treatise on the technical aspect of swordplay. It is focused on the mental and physical abilities and qualities of the fencer. It stresses the unity of body and mind, and above all, this book gives an insight into Hope's way of thinking and his almost scientific method. Hope starts out with renewed criticism of the French system. Uh, to him, while it has, quote, bon grass, and, quote, appears brisk and courageous, it is insecure and dangerous since it lacks and emphasizes on parading and is of, quote, hot constitution. In short, Hope judges the French way unsafe and dangerous swordplay. In order to correct these faults, the Scotsman sets out to analyze particular situations in order to derive general rules for an engagement, which he claims are of universal validity since they may be easily adapted to particular situations during an, quote, occasion with sharps. Hope writes, you may perceive the great advantage general rules have over particular ones, and it is the abstract of those general rules that are of such admirable use, which I am to set down to you together with the reasons in the following sheets. Of course, this mirrors an, mirrors an inductive method, which tries to derive generally valid rules from the observation of particular situations, and which was so much beloved by many proponents of the European Enlightenment. And more, hope the experienced soldier knew as every soldier who has ever been in battle, that battle is chaos. And also, um, uh, a dueling situation is chaos. And um, here we also find the word reason, which is so important to Hope's system. In the Vatamecum, Hope establishes eight general, general rules and attaches great importance to explaining what the reasons for each of these particular rules are. Um, in modern words, he emphasizes the creation of declarative knowledge. And I'm very thankful to Mario Staller, who today um, introduced this term, which really fits what Hope did at that time. Hope, however, um, um, the only acceptable way uh, of uh, pursuing his art for Hope was to discard all passions, all ir irrationalities, um, but to apply soberness and judgment and to ever better one's skills in order to overcome ignorance. Thus, he asks, is it not therefore far more commendable that if we overcome, we may be said to have done it by art and judgment and not at random and by chance, more beseeming and irrational than irrational creature? To hope, ignorance creates passion, and passion ultimately leads to death. Thus, a true swordsman has to study theory and to practice as much as possible. 
Hope finally boils down the necessary qualities of a true swordsman to three major principles, which form a precondition to master his system of swordplay. It is the trinity of calmness, vigor, and judgment. Judgment, he writes. Now these three words in general, being the only foundation upon which all true fencing is built, and each word in particular being, as it were, a column or a pillar by which my rules are to be supported. Finally, hopes even, hope even visualizes the most important principles of the philosophy of his song play, this being something the Age of Enlightenment was very fond of, it looks like that, with calmness, vigor, and judgment, use a close guard, the contracovating parade, binding, with calmness, vigor, and judgment, prevent a contretemps, being without distance, resting upon a thrust. The Vademecum was, without any doubt, an essential and necessary preliminary work for William Hope's major opus, the new method, which is, yeah. Uh, the Vademecum established his methodology, paved the way to the eventual breach with the French system, and set the governing principles of what was now presented as a very much unique way of swordplay. The new method, method thus casts into practical advice the more abstract principles of the Vademecum. First of all, this means radical simplification. Hope almost completely discarded prime and tiers, keeping only second and quart. There's only one major parade, which Hope calls the true cross, and there is a very much reduced variety of thrusts. And finally, there is only one guard on which Hope's system relies, the hanging guard. Um, and this hanging guard is very different from the then prevailing quad guard. This is uh, um, a picture from another book because uh, it's a nicer quad guard. Um, uh, and it is taken from Scottish and English broadsword systems, as, uh, as I said. Hope chose this kind of guard this, since he considered it a more natural, it's a quote, position than the quad guard, which he judged too constraining, also a quotation, and thus not providing sufficient cover for the lower body. Moreover, he considered the hanging guard the best position for his preferred kind of parade. Above all, however, there was the desire to simplify things and to create a universal system of salt play. Thus Hope writes, quote, thus I have shown you exactly how this excellent hanging guard is to be kept with any kind of weapon, either a food or horseback, from which I intend to draw such a secure and general defense against the thrusts and blows of all weapons, and all weapons he meant, even much heavier ones. Defense and security in encounters of very different character are core and bone of the new method. Hope refused the risky techniques. In his system, there is no vaulting and no circling. A lunging, he judged dangerous as well. The Scotsman demanded control of the opponent's blade by always binding it. Moreover, he was not a friend of feints, which he judged dangerous since they could offer an opponent an opening. Hope tried to establish a universal system fitting for any blade in use at this time and all occasion, occasions which could arise, duel, war, and above all, self-defense in that unruly and violent time of his. Consequently, Hope not only simplified his system, but also de-ritualized it and attached great importance on practi practicability. The result was a no-nonsense attitude in which effectiveness ruled. Thus, Hope not only recommended the use of the left hand, he downright demanded it. Breaking measure, he did not consider cowardly, as many Italian and French um, fencing masters did, but useful, and he introduced into small sword play the blow next to the thrust. Now, one may be tempted to regard Hope a fencing nerd. Well, typically, for someone touched by the gentle hand of enlightenment, he was not. Hope showed a strong pedagogical impetus and was highly concerned with the dark and deadly flip side of his trade. 
He published a book on the teaching aspect of fencing in 1692. The quote, fencing master's advice is a collection of advices for rules and fencing schools. It deals with its layout, the course of training, and the behavior of the scholars. There was even an attempt to institutionalize the art. The book contains a copy of the, quote, original contract of the Society of Swordmen in Scotland. It was an attempt, on the one hand, to curb the spread of the deadly art, on the other hand, to tame violence by self-imposed rules. The society obviously has existed, however, it seems as if it was a rather short-lived project. The reason behind this attempt was, of course, the social implication of swordplay, namely dueling. Hope did very well recognize this. He was a staunch enemy of dueling and anxious to curb this kind of ritualized violence by various means. And, of course, he wrote a book on that. Um, a Vindication of the True Art of Self-Defense, published in Edinburgh in 1724 and posthumously in London in 1729, was actually an anti-dueling book. In the book, Hope vindicates fencing for the purpose of just war and for any kind of self-defense. On the other hand, he strongly rejected dueling. To make his point, he applies moral, philosophical, and to a much lesser extent religious reasoning. Again, he suggests taming the duel by means of an institution. For Hope, the Leviathan was supposed to curb dueling where human reason was failing. Thus, he again came forward with the idea of an association of swordmen, this time accompanied by a suggestion to erect a Scottish court of honor, which was supposed to solve all disputes which usually would have led to duels. The Scottish Parliament even debated this matter. However, Hope's idea never materialized. Please allow me to conclude. There is much more to be said about the enlightened fencing master William Hope, his knowledge of Latin, his love for the classics, his doggerel verses. Well, he would have challenged me for that one, I guess. And of course, his attitude for religious versus re uh, to religion versus reason. However, what we may discover in William Hope books already now is that early enlightenment in Scotland was a widespread affair that reached far beyond university and intellectual clubs. Its main attributes, use of reason, critique of the traditions, and relying on human experience did influence people like the relatively humble soldier and fencing master William Hope, and more. It turned the fencing master into a proponent of enlightenment. I would like to close with one of his verses, uh, which again shows Hope, Hope's love for general principles derived from experience, which were supposed to guide human beings at the same time, allowing them to adapt to the unknown, surprising, and violent. O oh, useful abstract, who possesses thee? And thy just precepts practice with these three, calmness, vigor, and judgment, needs no man's point or edged sabre fear, since by thee from all dangers he is secure. Thank you very much. was, uh, first of all, he was simplifying it. Uh, there were about, in, in some French systems, you have about uh, 20, 25 ways of thrusting. He reduced it dram dramatically to, uh, to eight. And, for instance, there is uh, no saluting in Hope's books. He didn't salute. Uh, he attempted just to kill. <laughs> A shearing sword is uh, a, uh, um, it's basically a, um, a, a variant of uh, the Scottish broadsword, uh, which was used in England uh, rather than in Scotland, uh, with a, with a, a bit shorter blade as far as I know.
there, there were no two-handed weapons at that time. It's, it basically means the small sword uh, and the Scottish broadsword. So that's... And the spadroon, yeah. Yes. Um, so did he actually write something about the uh, horse weapon? Yeah, no? uh, he, he translated... Uh, he, he did translate... Uh, oh, sorry. Well, that's that. Um, he did translate uh, a French book on uh, on an, on, uh, on horse riding, um, and he added some uh, some ideas of his own uh, to this book. I haven't seen it yet, um, which is a pity. It's the only one I haven't seen. Um, but he was um, even today uh, in in Hope Town. Uh, there are legends told about him. I mean, uh, there's a legend about his death. There is a legend. Uh, how he fought a duel in the open on horseback and then on foot. And uh, he is still renowned as a keen dancer, horseman, and fencer. I like this trinity very much, and especially the dancing aspect. Thank you very Thank much. You.